the fatty acid content of our subcutaneous tissue as humans has changed. Let's talk butter versus vegetable oils or seed oils for just a moment here. And I'm not talking about the physical makeup of butter. I'm talking about downstream. What's happening when it comes down to liver fat? What's happening when it comes down to regular fat, potentially even cholesterol? Let's have this discussion because it needs to be a nuanced one. And I don't particularly have a dog in the fight. I want to look at the literature and understand what's going to be best for us as individual people with different lifestyles, different contexts, et cetera. The evidence is quite eye-opening. As I was doing this research, I was finding, wow, okay, that makes a lot more sense. And wow, maybe I'll start limiting consumption there. Point is, we need to get down to the science on both sides, not live in an echo chamber, and look at what's happening here. After today's video, I put a link down below for Seed Daily Symbiotics. Seed is a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. And they've been a sponsor on this channel for a very long time, and that's why there is an awesome 25% off discount link in the top line of the description. So if you wanna try them out, that is the opportunity right there to get a cool price on it. So basically, they have two capsules in one. So you have a multi-stage delivery where the prebiotic breaks down first, and then the probiotic can sort of get past that first stage of digestion and potentially colonize the bacteria where it needs to colonize, not just get destroyed by the hydrochloric acid in your gut. Makes it very unique, and they have a lot of clinical trials backing their stuff up, which is what I appreciate about them. So again, that's a 25% off discount link. I think you'll notice a pretty big difference in digestion, but also I notice it with mood, I notice it with sleep. The gut biome plays a lot bigger role than a lot of us give it credit for. So that link, top line of the description, underneath this video. I need to open this video up by talking about a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And before you peg me one way or the other, you need to watch this entire video because I am going to look at both sides and we're going to understand more about it. So this particular study took a look at 67 people with abdominal uh, obesity, so they're fat around the midsection. It was a 10-week study where they had them eat their normal diet except they, one group replaced their fats with butter and the other group they replaced their fats with vegetable oil. So it was quite literally a butter versus a vegetable oil diet. Now these were somewhat metabolically unhealthy people, again abdominal obesity. After 10 weeks, what they found is that the polyunsaturated fatty acid group, the group that had the vegetable oils in this case, they had lower levels of liver fat. Now, don't click off this video because I know that a lot of my core audience doesn't like seed oils and I understand that. We need to look at the whole picture. So the liver fat ended up going down, which is interesting. Now additionally, in the saturated fat group, circulating insulin went up after 10 weeks and insulin sensitivity went down. So they were actually responding worse to carbohydrates and insulin in the saturated fat group. What the heck? Thomas, what are you doing? What, what are we talking about? Trust me, just we have to understand multiple pieces. Another thing they noticed is that inflammatory markers in the polyunsaturated fatty acid group went down. The first thing that we have to look at and we have to understand this is that this is a short-term intervention. And as this video goes on, you'll understand there's a difference between short-term intervention and what's happening longer term. Short term, if you take someone off of a bunch of saturated fats, you will probably see improvements in some of these things. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that polyunsaturated fatty acids go through beta oxidation faster. They oxidize quick. So if you pull someone off of a junk food diet and you put them on you know, eating nuts and eating seeds and things like that, there's a good chance they're gonna oxidize more fat and liver fat will come down. That's, that's, that's kind of a no-brainer to be frank because we do know that the Mediterranean diet is a really good diet. Like it, it has a lot of good properties to it, but the Mediterranean diet is looking at really good, wholesome polyunsaturated fats. We're not looking at oxidized oils that are potentially problematic. We also know that short term, polyunsaturated fats can potentially inhibit some of the fatty acid synthesis in the liver. So it can actually block some of the fat accumulation. Now, again, we need to address this more so. What can happen with saturated fats when we consume operative words, too much of them, especially in an overfeeding or surplus state, is these fats can lead to too much in the way of fatty acids, free fatty acids circulating. 
This leads to the mitochondria not being able to fully oxidize all those fats, and you're left with what are called partially oxidized fatty acids, which can lead to an inflammatory response. So this A has to do with probably consuming too much of them in one sitting or too much of them over a short period of time. But another piece that's really important to note is the metabolic health of the individual. If someone is metabolically healthy, they can probably oxidize the fats more efficiently. Then there is this other aspect of the down regulation of PCSK9, which is a gene that's associated with cholesterol synthesis in the first place. So polyunsaturated fatty acids have been demonstrated to decrease, down regulate this PCSK9, which therefore leads to less overall cholesterol formation. That is only one piece of the equation. Okay, we're gonna talk more about cholesterol in a second because just lowering overall cholesterol, that doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. That's not an exciting discussion to have because I don't think it's about the total cholesterol. I think most of us know it. it's more about the particulars of it. No pun intended, particles, particulars. So now there was a study published in Open Heart that was a large systematic review, not just one study, a large systematic review, and the biggest, most important piece of this whole thing is that the fatty acid content of our subcutaneous tissue as humans has changed. In 1959, the linoleic acid content of our subcutaneous fat was about 9%, 9% linoleic acid. In 2008, that was all the way up to almost 22% linoleic acid. So the literal physical composition of our fat has changed. Interestingly enough, this aligns with the obesity rate. Now, that doesn't mean everything because correlation doesn't equal causation, but here's what's important to note. The overall amount of linoleic acid in our fat tissue, the composition of linoleic acid in our fat tissue is a literal associated risk factor for coronary artery disease. Like that is listed as a risk factor, having high amounts of linoleic acid as your subcutaneous fat. So that alone is a risk factor. So we know longer term as a whole, when we're consuming these things all the time, it could be problematic. But the operative word there is could be because there is another piece to this puzzle and that is oxidation. And it's one of the most important pieces that we should recognize. I'm gonna read you a quote from the systematic review that's pretty powerful. The evidence is resounding that oxidized LDL is important in the formation of atherosclerosis. LDL particle oxidation, the actual oxidation of LDL itself is really the big problem. Oxidized LDL is huge, and it is initiated by the oxidation of the linoleic acid within the LDL particle itself. For what it's worth, it's also the most commonly oxidized. So not only does oxidized LDL begin when that linoleic acid is oxidized, that linoleic acid seems to like to be oxidized. Once it is oxidized, then aldehydes and even ketones can actually bind to the ApoB, and this makes it so that the LDL can no longer dock in its receptor. It looks different now, so it can't dock in its normal receptor in the liver. So what ends up happening is it circulates, and it ends up docking in a receptor of what is called a scavenger. So scavenger receptors will pick it up, and thus begins the cycle. So what we're seeing out of this, based on this, is that polyunsaturated fatty acids in the short term can be good for overall biomarkers. And they're probably good to eat in their whole food form. Both polyunsaturated fats in the way of omega-3s and in the way of even some omega-6s. What's interesting is that when we look at PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, like we need to be encompassing omega-3s, right? Because this is a whole different world, whole different ball game when you start looking at prostaglandins and the inflammatory pathway there and arachidonic acid. I'm not even gonna go there today because this video would be 30 minutes long, easy. Okay, what's interesting is that when the linoleic acid, when these oils are not oxidized, when they're in a whole food form, and when they're not in an overfed state with other BS hyper-processed stuff, 
they're probably not bad. If anything, they probably are cardiometabolically protective. As a matter of fact, they, they could even be good in a lot of different ways. They could really be good for insulin resistance. That's not false. So that's where we have to be able to look at these things and be like, okay, we can't just totally demonize them. Like there is, there makes sense there. And we started to take a good thing and we bastardized it is what we did. We took a good thing, like, okay, Mediterranean polyunsaturated, good thing, and we bastardized it. We turned it into this oxidized nonsense mess that's everywhere. Now we can't avoid it. That, I don't think, is the plan or should be the plan because long term, we might be running a little bit of a risk. Now, the thing still applies that if someone is overfeeding saturated fats, it's probably a serious issue too. So now we're gonna look at another study that helps us understand when to use saturated fats and like, how do we do that delicate dance there? So this study was published in Diabetes Care and they took 38 subjects and they overfed them 1,000 calories. So they gave them 1,000 calorie surplus of either saturated fat, unsaturated fats, or sugar. So what they found here was pretty wild. They found that when they overfed subjects saturated fat, it increased their intrahepatic triglycerides, their liver fat, 55% compared to unsaturated fat increased the liver fat 15%. I'm not done though. Sugar increased the liver fat 33%, 98% increase in de novo lipogenesis, which means 98% of the fat that came from the sugar excess group was new fat. It was new fat formed from de novo lipogenesis. Brand new, new everywhere. Here's the particulars and here's the nuance and I hope that you're listening to this because this is everything that matters. The saturated fat group increased lipolysis. Lipolysis is fat mobilization. But lipolysis without mobilization doesn't do us much good. As a matter of fact, the excess saturated fat group increased lipolysis to the point where a majority of the fat that was stored in the liver was actually from adipose tissue lipolysis, meaning saturated fat was consumed, the body liberated adipose, liberated fats from the fat tissue, those circulated and deposited in the liver. This is gonna be grossly incorrect to illustrate it this way, but it's going to get the point basically across, is that it's like overfeeding saturated fat allowed fat to pull from like the waist or pull from the legs, go through the bloodstream and redeposit into the liver. As a matter of fact, with saturated fat, only 26% of the fat that deposited was from new fat formation. Again, you compare that to sugar, where 98% of it was new fat formation and 33% of that depositing in the liver. You can see that sugar could compound very quick, even quicker because you're getting new fat all the way around and it's depositing versus like saturated fat might be sneaky because you might not put on fat in a subcutaneous region, but you might like pull it from other areas and pack it in the liver, which would really not be good. So from a visceral fat perspective and stuff like that, we have to pay attention to that. Here's what's interesting to extrapolate from this though, because now you're thinking I'm just a saturated fat hater, but I'm not. If you are active and you actually use the fat that is mobilized, saturated fat could be quite beneficial and it's got a lot of neurological properties in terms of like helping brain health and whatnot. But additionally, this was in an overfed state. This is so important to note. An overfed state where they were eating a standard American diet and then just added a thousand calories of saturated fat or a thousand calories of poly. So point is, is if you are in an overfed state, Yes, saturated fat becomes exponentially problematic. If you're eating a standard American diet, it would not be a good idea to add extra saturated fat. That is part of the problem when people don't change their diet, but then they suddenly add like a bulletproof coffee to their diet. We understand the benefits of saturated fat. There are benefits there. Okay, it doesn't mean that you add more just because you can because saturated fat in a surplus is going to be very problematic. But now it makes us wonder, once you're already metabolically healthy and active, saturated fat might actually be one of the better fats that you can have. So it's all about the delicate dance there. Whole solid foods 
polyunsaturated fats from nuts and from seeds and from sparing olive oil use, saturated fat coming from non-hyperpalatable forms, okay? Cheeses, like good cheeses that are aged, good healthy cuts of meat, Saturated fat coming from dairy has significantly better effects in so many ways because there's different fatty acid profiles that are really good. So yes, you can enjoy that, but you should also, and you're gonna laugh at me for saying this, be in a reasonable caloric range and not in a surplus, and dare I say it, be active. So longer term, I don't think adding more linoleic acid is the answer. Longer term, I think being able to use these polyunsaturated fats in their whole food form, for what they are worth is absolutely the answer. And eating the whole foods that are stable naturally because they're whole foods, that's probably gonna be more of the answer. I'll see you tomorrow.